let's go now into the atmosphere. And um, let's think about the maintenance of low frequency variability. How does the atmosphere stay in a particular configuration over long periods of time? And what is the relationship between those low frequency variations and these fast transient eddies? So um, on the top row here, we have some analysis, some data analysis, where a particular low frequency pattern has been picked out. So this is a composite analysis. And, and you can't see here, but the, this is a plot of the northern hemisphere. And at, at the bottom is North America. Okay. And so this is the Pacific. And, and you see this typical pattern, low, high, low. That's called the PNA pattern, the Pacific North American pattern. And it's a very important feature of the low frequency variation of the atmosphere is that it very often finds itself in this sort of configuration, either in either positive or negative, low, high, low, like that, the PNA pattern. And so the question is, does that get dissipated by the transient eddies? Or does that get augmented by the transient eddies? And so what's, what's been plotted here on the right is the tendency of the height, so this is geopotential height, the tendency due to the transient eddy fluxes during those episodes of positive PNA. And you can see that it's in phase and has the same sign. So we have a low, high, low in the PNA, and then this transient eddy flux is also negative, positive, negative. So it's reinforcing the pattern. During episodes of positive PNA, transient eddy momentum fluxes will act to maintain that, that pattern in the geopotential height. If we look at the temperature fluxes, so here's the same uh, composite, and we'll see what we see is cold, warm, cold. And then we look at the transient fluxes of temperature. There it's not the same. You have positive, negative, positive. So the, the transient fluxes of, of heat are warming up where it's cold and cooling down where it's warm. So they're dissipating the temperature signature, but they're reinforcing the signature in, in uh, vorticity or, or momentum. Right? Um, so that's the action, that's systematically the action of transient eddies on low frequency atmospheric variability patterns. And here at the bottom, here's, a, here's a, an example of a very long lived type of feature that you can get in the atmosphere, which we sometimes have over Europe called blocking, in which there is a stable configuration of a, a high to the north and a low to the south. So a kind of reverse dipole in the pressure field. And that brings us, in the wintertime, that brings us very cold air from, from Russia. And uh, it stays there for a long time, right? And it's interesting to analyze what these transient systems coming across the Atlantic do to this, this pattern. Do they sweep it away or do they try to maintain it? And the evidence is that they will maintain it. And that's why it's such a long-lived feature. So here's an experiment, and this is the potential for vorticity flux divergence in, a, in an idealized model where you have this reverse dipole downstream and there's a wave maker upstream which generates lots of high frequency disturbances and they impinge upon this stable block and they will, the, the transfer of potential vorticity is such as to maintain that block against dissipation. Let's think about how do transient eddies modify the atmospheric response to some other external forcing. And so let's go back to the same equation again. There's our PV development equation. And let's take the time average again. So the time average of the PV flux is just the average forcing minus the average dissipation. We'll call it G. And then let's split that time average PV flux into a flux by the time mean, and we'll take the transient flux and put it on the right, consider it to be a forcing, and we'll call that H. So two forcings. One is the real forcing, and the other is a forcing that includes the transient eddy fluxes, G and H, all right? And they can be used to drive a model, those two forcing terms. So let's, to start with, let's just say G is going to drive our atmospheric model. And this is a technique that I've used a lot in, in my research. You can diagnose G from data. 
and I can use it to drive a simple model, and what you get is a simple GCM, right? So there's one experiment, and then we'll say, well, what happens if there's a perturbation, right? So let's say there's a perturbation to the sea surface temperature. And so we'll do the same experiment again, but we'll just add an extra bit of forcing associated with that perturbation. And there's the result. There's an example where you have added a perturbation to the Western Pacific. And this is the difference between those two long runs of a simple GCM, between this experiment and this experiment. So it's this one minus that one. Right? And here's the result. It, it's a global response. Okay? You have a big high downstream in the Pacific. You have a low over the pole. And you have another high over the Atlantic European sector. Okay, we have a global response. So now let's ask the question, what is the importance of the transients in that response? So you can diagnose, again, the, the part which is due to the change in the transient forcing. Because these two experiments will not necessarily have the same value of this, this transient component to the forcing. Right, so here's the difference in that. Right, now let's do another experiment. Let's take the same model. And instead of forcing it with G, we'll force it with H. So H is everything. So now if we initialize the model with its time mean state, and then we force it with H, what's going to happen? Well, nothing at all, because H is exactly what you need to stop development. All right? But then we can again add that forcing perturbation, and now we have a perturbation model. We have a model which the transient part is already taken into account in the forcing we apply, we can add a perturbation to the forcing, and if it's small, we'll even have a linear perturbation model. And what we get, we add this uh, Pacific sea surface temperature anomaly, this is the response, and it's not the same as before. This is just the linear response, and this is the fully nonlinear response with, the, with modified transient eddy feedback. So the linear response is not as global, it's basically just the Pacific response. So then the question is, can we prove that the difference between these two is due to this change in the transient eddy forcing? And can we prove it just using a linear model? So that's easy. We can just take this, scale it appropriately, and stick it into this model as an extra bit of forcing. You see? So here it is. And then we do another linear experiment. And what we get is this. Right? So now this looks very much like that. Okay? And yet, it's not the same kind of experiment at all, because this is, a, this is the difference between two fully nonlinear turbulent experiments. And this is just a linear model response in which the turbulence has been added as some kind of constant forcing. And so what we've done here is we've proved that in a linear framework, you can reproduce the effect of nonlinear transient eddies. Okay. Now, that's interesting to think about because, uh, and that's what I'm going to come on to now, it, it comes down to some very fundamental things about the importance of nonlinearity in low frequency variability. And so, to start with, right, there's absolutely no question that the dynamics of the atmosphere and ocean is fundamentally nonlinear. I mean, I've talked several times about the difference between highs and lows. They're not the same because the dynamics is nonlinear. And yet, the contribution of transient fluxes to low frequency variability, is that automatically a nonlinear phenomenon because we know that the dynamics is nonlinear? Or can it be thought of as a linear phenomenon? So you change something, the transients change one way, you change it in the opposite way, will the transients change in the opposite way? That would be linear, right? Or is something else going to happen? So you can see that they're not exactly the same question we're asking on those two different timescales. The first question is, are these eddies nonlinear? The answer is yes, definitely. The second question is, is the aggregate systematic effect of these eddies in modifying the atmospheric response, response to other types of forcing, is that nonlinear? Well, yes, maybe, but it's not the same question we're asking. Okay? And so here is um, the way people view this. And, and I'd say this is... This is not a subject on which there is universal accord in the research community. There are, there's a spectrum of opinions, uh, right from, from one 
type of opinion where people say everything is fundamentally nonlinear, and these, uh, on this point of view usually identifies the Lorentz attractor, which is that famous um, butterfly attractor, as, as a good model for atmospheric variability on low frequencies. And there's no doubt that if you look at this, th this is um, the Lorentz system in a kind of Lorentz phase space, and there are many, many points here which are the instantaneous state of the system throughout a long integration of the simple Lorentz uh, uh, equations. And you can see that they cluster very clearly onto two nodes. So it's a bimodal distribution in one of the variables here. Uh, and so an appropriate way to look at that is to think about regimes, okay? You go from, you're in this regime, and then you transfer to this regime. And the time you spend between those regimes is quite small compared to the time you spend in either one or the other, right? So that might be a useful way to think about the atmosphere. And so here is another plot of some other type of atmospheric phase space. So this is the, the state of the atmosphere, the global atmosphere, plotted as two patterns, right, which are both very important patterns which explain a lot of the low frequency variability. On the horizontal axis, we have the PNA, okay, Pacific North America there. And on the vertical axis, we have something that looks more like the NAO, like it's mostly in the North Atlantic. Uh, so PNA, remember, is Pacific North American, and NAO is North Atlantic Oscillation. Right? And so if you plot in PNA, NAO space, you plot monthly means of the atmospheric state and, and just put them as points on this, in this space, and you can plot the PDFs on the, on the side in, the, in terms of the two axes. And then the question is, are we clustering in two regimes? Do we see regimes in this diagram? Well, that's something that not everybody agrees about. It's possible that they're clustering into regimes and it's appropriate to think of transitions between the regimes and all that. Or it's possible that this is just a finite sample and in a finite sample, statistically random variables, you're always going to find some sort of clustering if you have a finite data set. And so it is also appropriate to, to think of it in that way and think, well, maybe we can explain all this in a linear framework because in linear dynamics, you generally have Gaussian statistics. You won't have these bimodal statistics that you have with the Lorentz attractor. Okay? So here's a linear equation that we can use. So we, we can say that if x is the state vector that represents the, the entire state of the atmosphere, um, then its variation will be determined by a linear operator and some external forcing and some Gaussian noise. And that Gaussian noise can be modified by another linear operator, and it's still a linear system. Now, if that second linear operator is independent of the, of the flow x, then we still have Gaussian statistics everywhere. But it's possible, even with this linear system, to have non-Gaussian statistics, so you can have skewed PDFs if you want, provided that this b is a function of the flow x. Um, you can even get skewed distributions that are non-Gaussian in a linear framework. So you can go a long way also with linear analysis of low-frequency variability.